Welcome to Learning with Lowell. I'm your host, Lowell Thompson. We cover biotech and science-related topics on this show, such as startups working on antibiotic drugs or colon cancer, to venture capitalists talking about funding and how that worked, to people talking about how they and you could found a science-backed startup. Two, and this is one of my favorite parts, people talking about science, specific science-related topics such as whales or protein engineering. You're really going to get a lot, and it's all going to be about science on this podcast. There are two main episode types. One, the case study where one or a group of people talk about what they did, and you can kind of get a sense of how you could do it as well. To the second type, which is a group talking around a theme such as citric greening, which is coming up soon, or neurodegenerative disorders, which I'm also working on. Please sign up for our newsletter to get a other resources and outside podcast content from guests of my own research, which comes out every Monday. Join us every Tuesday for new podcast releases and check out the website every Thursday for something new. You can find us at, at Lowell's here on Twitter, Facebook, and my website, learningwithlowell.com. And don't forget to subscribe, tell your friends, and leave a review. It takes really only 10 seconds for you to do any of those things, which helps me and my guests create great content because it gives us feedback, lets other people know about it, and the more people know about science and support it, the better everything is. Today we have Misha and Robert of Cardio Diagnostics. We will be discussing their company, what it takes to be a good CEO, what they're working on, and the advancements in research technology, and how you can get the most intense results from the smallest amounts of blood, which is what they're working on. Let's get to it. Uh, thank you again for coming on our podcast. I have Misha and Robert here today. And from what I understand, you both are CEOs, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. So the first question I have for both of you is what what led you to this point? Like, how did you get to this point in your life? Well, the, the pathway for me started with um, a solid education in medicine and science. I did an MD-PhD at the University of Iowa followed by six years of training at the National Institutes of Health uh, headquarters for the Human Genome Project. Uh, Then after two kids uh, were on the way, um, I decided probably it was time to go to an area of the country where I could raise children a little bit more comfortably. Uh, D.C. is a tough place to raise uh, kids when both spouses work. And I settled back uh, in Iowa. uh, And when I came back from Iowa, what I was acutely aware of from uh, from going to the human genome meetings was that whereas genetics is an important cause of illness, the environment is an equally important cause of illness. And more importantly is, as opposed to genetic variation back then and still even now, we can change the environment much more easily than we can change someone's genetic contribution. So through one way or another, this led me into the study of epigenetics. Now, epigenetics is very easy for the layperson to understand. I always tell them to uh, touch their hand and touch their face. And when they touch their hand and they touch their face, each of the cells that they touch are genetically identical. But your hand and your face are very different in form and function. The reason that they are different is the is epigenetics. And epigenetics is the software programming that goes on top of the DNA hardware to control cell fate and cell function. When epigenetic functioning is well regulated and we are healthy, the environment and our genome interact to ensure that the cells in our hands are our muscle cells, bone cells, whereas the cells in our head are neurons and glia, and that each of these cells in their individual location form, form and function in a very healthy fashion. Unfortunately, when we drink too much alcohol or we smoke uh, tobacco or are exposed to other environmental uh, toxins, we start, our cells start on a pathway towards disease. Through my National Institutes of Health with a sponsored research at the University of Iowa, we determined that, determined new mechanisms through measuring epigenetic variation that we could use to measure an individual's exposure to these potentially preventable and treatable causes of disease. And that has led us to the point where we are at today. All right. Uh, 
As for me, I was doing, I after my bachelor's and my master's, I decided to go on to get a PhD. And um, when I decided that I was going to do my PhD in Rob's lab, um, I did my bachelor's and my master's in chemical engineering and then decided the better path to go, you know, just to focus on the research that we were doing, which is epigenetic research, was to then switch to biomedical engineering for my PhD. So I got done with my bachelor's and master's when I started my PhD in biomedical engineering. Rob and I were going back and forth about projects that I could work on as part of uh, my PhD. Now, being an engineer, when you start off even as early as your freshman year, you learn programming. And that was something that I was always interested in, kept it in the back burner, didn't really pursue it, anything more than now and then a class or two. So when I went on to do my PhD, I thought to myself, this field is really growing, the computational field. And now that the medical data sets are getting larger and larger, we're starting to profile different kinds of um, aspects of DNA, including epigenetics, genetics, it may not be a bad idea to kind of bring uh, the medical background and the heavy computation together. So like I said, we went back and forth, talked about possible options for a project, and decided that, um, long story short, decided that we were going to pursue this data set called the Framingham Heart Study data set and apply for it, see if we get it. And if we do, then tailor a study around it. And at that point, when we got approval to use the Framingham Heart Study data, we decided we were going to look at the relationship between uh, smoking, which is Rob's expertise and what he does um, on a daily basis for his research in the lab, and cardiac disease because smoking is a major risk factor for cardiac disease. So as part of, you know, working on that study, we stumbled upon um, the fact that bringing together our genetics and epigenetics could, could predict coronary heart disease better than we had expected. It's not that we didn't think it was going to work. Uh, of course, that was the premise before we started the study, but we didn't realize how well it would work with just a small amount of markers. So one led to another. We filed for patents through the university and decided to spin it off into um, a startup, which is Cardio Diagnostics, and that's how I landed where I am. Well, thank you, you both. Uh, I have a question. It's, it's, I think maybe Robert would be better at answering, but I'm interested to hear your perspective. The, the question is, how have things progressed when it comes to you starting your company versus seeing Misha start hers? How is it easier or is it harder to start up a biotech company today? As compared to 10, 15 years ago, I would say it's easier. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that, I think, is the more elucidation, the, the, the information on how, or, uh, how a physician can start a company is a little bit more accessible for instance, Small Business Administration through the National Institutes of Health. And I think the the uh, boom in the Silicon Valley has illustrated uh, to people around the nation and the globe how one can start with a good idea and gain traction through a disseminated community to push a uh, venture forward. Does that resonate? Yeah, that, that makes complete sense. I mean, at this point, it's more welcomed, um, mm -hmm. the idea of a startup. So I remember talking to a friend from um, Japan who speak about how their culture really um, it rewards um, experience, rewards you know, people who have established, and he really wanted to have a startup. And in that sense, I think, the American culture really is conducive to mm -hmm. startups and encourages people to pursue uh, uh, the dream. If you have an idea and innovation, the culture is 
there to kind of push you forward. Well, it's, it's wonderful because Misha's an immigrant. I guess this is the land of opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> you, know, you know, grow up in an Iowa farm, uh, this is the land of escape from detasseling. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I was born and raised in Malaysia and moved to the uh, to Iowa when I was 19. So um, I love it here. I I lived here for over 10 years now. So. Why why uh, Iowa of all the places oh. in America like Heartland? <laughs> uh, my sister was doing her undergrad at Northern Iowa, mm -hmm. and uh, my family just thought that it might be better for us both to live in the same state, but little did they know that we hardly saw each other <laughs> <laughs> or hardly made the trip to visit each other because, you know, being in school, it's just busy. Um, but yeah, I ended up at University of Iowa because of the medical campus, truly, because I was trying to decide between engineering and Iowa State and um, University of Iowa and always kind of lean towards the human medical world and thought University of, of Iowa was the better uh, option for me and uh, wanted to do engineering and have loved it so far, still loving it. That's great. Um, as a new CEO, what resources do you use or what things are you trying to learn to be great at? Like you, you see Robert do, you know, his daily, daily stuff. Mm -hmm. Are you, to some extent, you know, like marrying what he's doing versus what are you finding online? Like what, if the question could be put much better, um, what are you, what are you doing to be a great CEO? Like what are the, what are the things like, you know, book resources, online resources, resources at U of I, uh, mm -hmm. Robert, like what are, the, what are some of the things that you're using to, to like be great? So Rob starting behavioral diagnostics was definitely, um, has definitely reduced the amount of startup startup time cardio has needed because he has had his connections over the years and connections through behavioral diagnostics and probably thinks that he he learned the hard way <laughs> starting off behavioral diagnostics is not needed for cardio diagnostics because he was here and he didn't even charge for it. <laughs> is, is there another way behind besides the hard way? <laughs> Well, the startup time, I guess, for cardio wasn't as uh, hard just because Rob was established in the startup world and uh, our CFO um, has done, you know, extensive uh, work in the startup world and other people we work with closely. So in that sense, I had a lot of people to kind of bounce off questions and get answers from and learn from them. But I mean, you always, you always never want to stop trying to figure out things on your own. You never mm -hmm. want to stop reading. You never want to stop learning because even when you have other resources like Rob or others at your disposal, you, if you don't have the questions to ask, you're never going to learn. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, you know, you always want to be self-sufficient, but always know that you have additional resources and other people that you can always go back to with a question mm -hmm. or help that you need. What are some of the next big hurdles that you're working on? Oh, uh, I have a long laundry list of them, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll start with the with a few. So, being a medical test, a diagnostic test, it is very very important for us. Um, of course, as a startup and as people, and you know, people who continuously strive to do better and research um, this tool better. Validation is really important, in my opinion. Um, we can't publish a single paper, or we can't uh, we can't test it once and be content with it and try to get it out in the world. We, we have to do our due diligence, and we have to make sure that uh, we are measuring what we think we're measuring, and we're showing it independently. You know, a handful of times. So, uh, for us to be able to do that. You need a lot of resources, and medical resources are good ones to have and um, are not necessarily ideal. What you have may not be ideal. So I think the biggest challenge at this point for us is to um, connect with others out there who have the resources that we need, who who are willing to form the collaboration 
because we truly think we can make a difference in you know in the cardiac health field so to be able to kind of negotiate the partnerships and collaborations with uh, with others um is is always good and it's kind of the biggest challenge right now uh to move to the next step uh more so as far as you know kind of uh, everyone's time everyone's uh, you know what everyone's bringing to the table those kinds of details but in the grand scheme of things validation is going to be crucial and it's something that uh, we're working on really seriously when it comes to finding partnerships because that was the, the second part you mentioned mm-hmm. uh, is there a good way of, like how do you differentiate between a good partnership and a bad partnership maybe that's something that Robert would be a better answer but you're in the field. So. Oh. <laughs> well, I think the the first uh, critical element in a fruitful partnership is honesty. Is whether it's a marriage, a friendship, or a business relationship, there has to be a fundamental honesty. And the reason for that is, particularly in the startup uh, stage, synergy is absolutely essential. If both parties cannot trust that their back ends are being covered, the relationship will not proceed. The second is capability. The Just as an individual would not uh, go to a, uh, to a, a healthcare practitioner without clinical uh, clinical degree and licensing, when one uh, engages in a, with a partner, one has to have either the technical, logistic, or the financial capacities to to contribute to a partnership. And more importantly, it is better that if each partner in the binary relationship, tertiary relationships that uh, that develop have unique capabilities that contribute to a greater whole. What are some of the and it's all right if we can't go too specific on this, but what are some of the large type of partnerships you're looking for that have those unique capabilities that you need? So a uh, larger picture, I would say um, the, there are three. One it would be resources as far as DNA, because we're measuring you know genetic information and epigenetic information. So we want uh, someone who has a large biobank, someone who has those resources coupled with outcomes, cardiac outcomes in this uh, scenario. The second would be uh, financial resources. Of course, you know, if someone's going to give us X amount of money for a good deal or something that, you know, both parties agree on, um, that's something that we're looking forward to uh, working with whoever's uh, bringing it to the table and uh, negotiating that part. And the third is to start conversations with people who are then going to help us take what we have developed and validate it to the people out there, whether it's, um, you know, um, a, a testing center or physicians educating uh, users or, you know, people who would like uh, to be able to utilize uh, the tool. So those are the three kind of bigger pictures of uh, partnerships that we're looking at. And the best thing is that for right now, we're not in an emergency situation. Mm-hmm. My academic laboratory, I'm still a part-time physician at the University of Iowa. My academic consortium has one of the largest biobanks of clinical samples at the University of Iowa. Technically, the, the company, I'm a, uh, a skilled laptop molecular bi- uh, biologist. Our other partner in behavioral diagnostics is the director of a large diagnostic genomics facilities. So we have diagnostic excellence as well. Finances, we've got enough money to get by for now. However, in each domain, we could grow by forming very astute partnerships with individuals that are not only good, but are great at what they do. And that's what we're looking for into the future. You agree? Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Um, Jumping to the next question. I had 
I here's one of a, a more a larger one, and it touches back onto like what is a good CEO because I think with a lot of people that I talk to who are going to be users, I mean listeners to the podcast, not users, um, they always wonder like what what's the difference between like a CEO and like a regular person at the company, and like what what are the big differentiators in becoming like a good employee versus a good CEO? So it's kind of interesting as like a new CEO and like more of a seasoned CEO. What your opinions on that would be like if you could if you had like imagine like this table's full of Lego blocks of skills, experiences, and personality traits, and you could like build them to either make an ideal CEO for like then that would be you, or just in general, what would that Lego what type of pieces would you use as an analogy? Well, I think probably the most important uh, portion uh, uh, quality that a CEO has to have is vision. Um, and probably that is best exemplified by Elon Musk. And, it, you know, it, it never ceases to amaze me as to the wide variety of areas in which he succeeded. Now, most people know Elon Musk through SpaceX, but he's not a NASA engineer. Actually, he's a, his, his area, his initial uh, foray was founding PayPal. And yet, here, he's sending his car off to Mars or the asteroid belt. He clearly has a vision for space travel, for hyperloop travel, for trains and for cars. The man is a vision factory. He has a sense of what his optics for the future can be. And that's critical. You have to have an idea of where you're going to go. But second, I think, is probably a main characteristic of anyone in a successful venture. And whether that be the CEO, the CFO, or just a employee in a startup. And that is willingness to engage. And by engage, to explore. Maybe this will work better. Maybe I'll reach out to this person who has a little more expertise. One generally does not find, uh, find a grow by staying in a silo. Instead, one grows grows by venturing out and soliciting new relationships. And that is not only done by the CFO, but it has to be done by every member of a successful organization. So I will touch upon Rob's engaging part because I think that is something that I can appreciate as a new CEO. Uh, my expertise lie in high throughput computation. And um, I know it well, and I know it to bring us forward, but at the same time, you have to be open to working in a highly interdisciplinary team. So as a CEO, it's important for you to know different aspects of what's going on, but always be cognizant that you will not be the expert at everything. And you have to be open to the idea of bringing in the best people who you can trust to work with and executing it truly as a team. And I think, so the CEO would be higher level, bigger picture of the company. And I think employees, you know, working for a company should be the same. You're not necessarily working on all aspects, the overarching vision of the company, but at a smaller team level. You're still working with highly interdisciplinary people. Yes, you have your expertise and you have your group that you're working with, but you also have to be able to communicate with other teams and kind of bring the vision together. So you share, I would say a a CEO or an employee should share the same thought process, but maybe the level of execution is a little different. Mm -hmm. Is that consistent with your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, probably the, the, the final quality is, is realizing it ain't going to get done on a 40 hour work week mm-hmm. is I routinely put in 60, 70 hour weeks each and every week. And you know, the, the, the interesting thing is I don't see it as work. I feel sometimes I'm the luckiest person in the United States is because I get to pay to do what I really enjoy doing. It's got to be a, a pretty magical thing in, in that you guys kind of get to, if, if things work out, you get to like execute your vision in a way that most people don't really are able to do. You know, like you, 
have this company, you're a CEO of it, and you get to put it in a direction. And, you know, through trial and error, it either works or it doesn't work. But if it works, like like what he's saying, it's exactly what you want to be in. And, and like, is that kind of like, like five years from now, do you hope to have that type of contentment after everything has gone well? Or, yes. Uh, I mean, I'm not... Uh, I'm aware of the fact that things are always not going to go perfectly or exactly 100% the way I would want it to. Or maybe, you know, um, I would have to tweak my vision of what cardio diagnostics will look like five years down the road, maybe in the next six months, maybe in the next one year. Some mm-hmm. tweaking may have to happen. But that doesn't mean that the larger goal is any different. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that sense, uh, yes. Looking forward to kicking this through <laughs> and uh, making making truly a difference and being happy that we got the chance to do it. I mean, never in my wildest dream did I think my PhD thesis will be it will be spun into a startup. Uh, but that's just something that is is extremely exciting and it drives you to you know, see what else is out there that you can do to get this moving faster, better, um, and and just make it happen. But you know, the, the, the funny thing is, is that it is a realization things don't happen in isolation. Mm-hmm. As, as, as much as I'd like to thought, think that I was a good mentor, actually, Misha comes from a family of entrepreneurs to start with. Her uncle founded his own company. So, you know, to a certain extent, uh, uh, Yes, this is uh, Iowa is fertile ground in many ways, but I think Misha's car hit the ground running. I'll take that. Thought <laughs> <laughs> um, up a couple of questions. When it comes to timeline, uh, mm-hmm. you mentioned like year, six months, you know, how, mm-hmm. however long. Do you notice that you tend to think in certain increments, like you have like a maybe like a one-year plan and then you execute it or like how far in advance do you plan out your vision? Ten. Like at this, because it'd be interesting to hear like your response, like where, like where you need to be and then like, you know, do little things to get there versus like, you know, a seasoned person tends to do. You're asking a serial planner. (laughs) (laughs) A serial planner who starts my day off and ends my day by planning. (laughs) Um, so in that sense, I like to think of it as a larger goal and smaller goals, whether it's monthly, weekly, or daily, that you basically chip away at achieving a larger goal. I mean, things like, um, you know, the field that we are in requires us to, you know, like I said, do our due diligence, things like publications. Those are important. So those are smaller milestones that you plan for. Those are needed. You put the information out there. You support you support what you're developing. And then there's larger goals, commercialization, you know, where can we be? But again, it comes down to the fact that we're not playing alone. We're playing, you know, with others. We have collaborations. We have partnerships. So we have to be cognizant of, cognizant of everyone's um ability to produce things in a timely manner but that doesn't stop us from moving forward there's always something we can do to achieve um, our goals so short-term goals for sure uh but i would say you know we have a clear vision for the next one year um quite a clear vision of what we need to do to um to achieve one large milestone that we have uh set for ourselves and i say Beyond that, um, we have somewhat of a good vision for the next three to five years of how things will look like. So not not as clear as what the next one year would look like, but definitely some idea of where we would like to be in the next three to five years. That, well, yeah, fortunately, <laughs> you know, I guess uh, beside, between working with Misha and uh, being at home with my wife, who is an internationally known medical regulator, you may rest assured that each day I, uh, I function under a set of pre-printed uh, calendars. Mm-hmm. Fortunately, I get to color in uh, the dates for the milestones. Um, already, we our first smoking assay is in the market, and uh, the alcohol assay has just been introduced to the clinical market for, uh, for forensic uses. Uh, we have some very clear 
milestones in which these tests will be uh, introduced uh, nationally uh, for the forensic markets and, in fact, uh, beginning this fall for insurance agencies for assessments for health and life insurance policies. Eventually, our goal is to get back to what our, where our roots are at. I got in this business and medical research to make people better. You know, there's a lot of ways to make money. Uh, heck, it'd just be easy to get into a medical marijuana uh, uh, distributorship. But you know what? At the end of the day, that's not something that I'm going to be proud of doing. Instead, I got, um, I, uh, got my MD and PhD with the understanding that the people of the United States were paying for these degrees so I can make the world a better place. So with that in mind is, is that our goal here is to get the clinical market to get better tools to physicians, clinicians around the globe to make the assessment of substance use disorders and cardiovascular disorders easier and give them the tools through which they can guide treatment. I believe we're going to do it, and in fact, we are currently doing it. The only question is, is how fast we get to each area of the market. I agree. <laughs> um, so is that typically like overall around like a, a year and then like a five year, or is it tend to be a bit more like, because you, you said you have like a regimented type dates, but you get to color in the dates. Are they specific in the sense that, like Misha was saying, that it's pretty specific for like a year and then kind of like more nebulous in five years? Or like, do you have a different heuristic for developing like your plan? For behavioral diagnostic, it's much more concrete. Mm -hmm. We're already starting clinical testing. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> the, the real question is, when do we get the tests to the FDA? And we are already in conversation with the National Institutes of Health about that because I know clinicians want better tools mm -hmm. for assessing alcohol consumption. I know they want better tools for guiding smoking cessation treatment. Cardiovascular disorders are a tougher wicket. The infrastructure that we need to establish more complex. However, I am reasonably confident that we can develop and market a laboratory developed tests within a year. And I think it is within with uh, with some a level of assurance that I think we can get it uh, rolled out nationwide within three years. That's pretty great. When it when it comes to today's technology, if if today was like 100 percent, like what was out currently, how big of an improvement will this new technology bring? Like as we were talking about previously, and it seems like it's going to be a, a huge improvement. Just but for like a layman's person, like how would you describe the, the level of improvement? No, well, it's really easy for a physician. Yeah. For smoking, you know, there are good tests out there. There is absolutely no test out there for smoking intensity. And we can do that. We already can do it. The kid is right here with 100% accuracy, as you've seen from the publications. With respect to alcohol, there's nothing on the market like this. We can assess exactly how much you're drinking. And as you undergo alcohol cessation treatment, how successful that treatment is. But the sky is the limit for uh, Misha's technology. These are all single droplet of blood. Just one droplet of blood, conceivably at your local pharmacy, and poof, five hours later, a computer can tell you your exact risk for a variety of disorders and the interventions you and your healthcare provider should engage in to moderate your risk for those outcomes. It is a technical revolution, and it's made, pro it's made possible through the National Institutes of Health. Do you like uh, grant-type funding? Absolutely. This office you're looking at is funded by millions of dollars for the National Institutes of Health, for which we're very grateful. How does that type of process work? Like, uh, from needing the money to getting the money, like, I assume there's like a really long application procedure, but I, I've never had to do it, so I'm just kind of curious. Well, I think actually the Book of Job <laughs> characterizes it quite well. It's it's a long, arduous process, but you know where else is there dilution-free capital for these type of uh, ventures? And the answer is nowhere. The United States is a land of opportunity. 
you're basically writing, you're basically pitching your idea in pages, X number of pages, and you're writing it up and trying to convince your peers that it's a, uh, it's a good tool to have out there. And in the process, um, if you, if someone were looking for advice on how to kind of get into similar positions as yourselves, what type of experiences should they try and seek out and skills should they be trying to develop? So I would say Rob and I have complementary, but some overlapping, but also a lot of different skills. Um, so I don't necessarily think there is a list of five or six different skills that, you know, if you if you are to have these skills, then such is going to be an outcome. Um, but rather, I would say do what you enjoy and in the process, never be afraid to discover. Um, do I think that this would have been possible if I did not pursue my PhD? No. But does everyone who pursue a PhD go on to be CEOs or have a startup? No. So is there really a secret ingredient that I had a different outcome versus someone who didn't have the same outcome? I don't think so. I think uh, we kind of meshed our uh, capabilities, Rob's ex expertise in epigenetics and my expertise in the computational field. And I was actually going to go on to do data science. I actually spent three months in Chicago doing an internship in data science and thought, okay, I would finish my PhD, gain all the experience that I needed to gain from the medical perspective and applying it to real world data set. And I'm going to go on to be a data scientist. And I did what I love, which is computation. And I did what I love, which is medical research. So I don't really think there is a... A specific list that I can give besides the fact that, you know, always never be afraid to discover, uh, always be open to problem solving because it gets you thinking, it gets you, um, it gets you talking, it gets you reading. So in that sense, I think uh, I would suggest lifelong learning is probably a good one. Well, my, my viewpoint is number one is, is that first of all, in whatever field you're in, Strive for excellence. And the second is, however, is be open to experience. And third and finally, don't be afraid of failure. The number, the, the first, uh, with respect to the, the first gaining the training, is the reason I'm, uh, we're able to do this is because we've had the training. I'm a board certified physician. I have a PhD in molecular neuroscience. So when it really comes to brass tacks of assessing the field and understanding the evidence, I have sufficient training to, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff. The second is that one doesn't pan, uh, find gold lying around the parking lot. Instead, one has to go the highways and byways and quite literally look under the rocks and streams to find gold. In other words, you're going to have to engage. Find out what are new problems. Find out what solutions aren't working. And conversely so, find out what solutions are working for others that may work in a new instance. And then finally, don't be afraid to fail. In laboratory science, 90% of new experiments fail. That's to be expected. If one is expect, uh, afraid of failure, do not get into bench science. After all, we never prove what's true. In the pauperian uh, 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 approach to science, we simply prove, uh, show what we believe to be uh, false. So there is always a journey to discovery. And on that journey, it is highly unlikely that the road will be well paved. Instead, there will be stones, there will be sticks, and occasionally a few potholes. And whereas one never enjoys falling down, 
there is a certain invigoration of surviving a challenge and picking oneself up off the ground. I have to agree with that. Like, even if it's a like a long term goal, it always feels amazing when you're like getting the last couple of steps and you're able to like cinch it in. So it's I imagine when you're done with your one year, it's gonna feel pretty oh, great. Yes. It, it it would probably at the end of one year it would feel like um oh it wasn't that bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, in, in each in you know in each in each uh, journey uh, area of this uh, journey, it's it's been invigorating. You know, I was just kind of laughing with uh, Misha about the other days. Well, a year ago we weren't in these offices; we yeah. were just kind of in a cubbyhole. Because we, you know, we uh, we had moved our offices, and prior to that, we didn't have any offices at all. So it actually is growing exponentially, and now we have kits, and now we're commercially testing individuals. The possibility for growth, quite honestly, is nearly endless. And at the day, at the at the end of the day, and most importantly, at the start of the day, is the the greatest barrier. To success, I see in the mirror every morning. I don't want to know on reasons why it's going to fail. I want to know the pathways through which we are going to succeed. There's a myriad of pathways through which you can fail. There are a limited number of pathways through which you succeed. I only need one. Sounds like Edison. Did you? Uh, are you an Edison fan by chance? Oh no. <laughs> I wish I had his capacity to go without sleep. <laughs> yeah, that guy was, that's true. He, was, he was pretty, I think, uh, at one point in time. Yeah, that's the right word. That's the right word. I think he went like uh, four days without sleep once. Yeah, and I think given the number of patents he had, I think patenting fees have gone down <laughs> some, <laughs> since then. So well, yeah. that was, yeah, it was much easier back then. Additionally, he kept, uh, he was not the most savvy business person when it came to his patents. He would, he would sell them, and then they would go on to make like billion dollar companies, and he wouldn't really see that, all that much of it. Yeah, but you know, at the end, the guy, you know, guy finished well, so. Oh, yeah, no. He did all right for himself. There you go. He, uh, I don't know, just with, that, with him alone, I know it's kind of a, a digression, but like he, he invented quite quite a few number of things that most people aren't even aware of, like the phonograph. Mm -hmm. He, like, made that. Like, it's just, he kind of, like, started a bunch of, of, uh, industries. It's just interesting that he's only known for one. But, uh, I, I digress. Uh, what are some people that you two tend to, Maybe idolize or that you look to as like sources of inspiration. Oh boy, uh, I would say someone who has the gusto to go out and just get it done. Someone who has the spirit that we can get it done. We can do it. That kind of I feel every time that. For me, especially if I think, oh, you know, things are going a little slow, things are going not how I would like it to go, that for me is just refreshing. It's just, you know, get some of that spirit, um, just pick yourself back up and let's just keep pushing forward. I think sometimes when you're doing the day-to-day -day task, you can lose the larger picture and it's always nice to take a step back and think why are you doing this? And I have a, uh, I have a friend who once asked me, he said, would you be doing this if you had to do it for free? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I would. I mean, you know, if, if I didn't have to think about paying my bills, I didn't have to, you know, think about all the adult things that I needed to do day to day. I would do it for free. Cause I think, uh, I think it's, uh, uh truly interesting um i think we have only seen a small part of it there's just a lot more for us to do and um you know we're going we're going to figure out a lot more as we go along it, it's just the starting point so i i i think i would look every time i think about oh you know things are not going as fast or as well as i would like it to i think to people who just have that ability to wake up every morning and be like let's do this I kind of gain, gain inspiration from two people rather uh, I would say two unique individuals the first is Bill Gates and the second is surprisingly uh, Barack Obama 
Now, Bill Gates, I admire for number one is for an extreme work ethic. And number one is we're both sort of geeks. And, you know, and yet, despite by many, by many standards, it's sort of like goofy getting Snow White. It just doesn't really happen in real life. And traditionally in medicine, people that go into psychiatry, particularly looking at those with mental illnesses, do not develop technologies that translate and become extremely marketable and profitable. And yet that's clearly what's going to happen. And the reason I really admire Barack Obama and take some inspiration from there is because when this was first, the, the smoking test and the alcohol test were first uh, talked about as technologically, people were extraordinarily dismissive. And yet, you know, pretty much I had confidence in what I was doing and the measurements, what I've seen. Similarly, with Barack Obama, I think he took a lot of criticism for which was, uh, that was totally unmerited. Yet he stuck with his vision. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, he should be very proud of what he did, what he has done. And at the end of the day, I hope to be in a similar place here in about five years. But, uh, one thing, it's interesting about Obama is like how young he is. He's like 56. Yeah, he's like exactly my age. Yeah, wow. It's, I always kind of imagine presidents being older. But like, we have, we have like six alive nowadays. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, we have like the highest rep number. Yeah, they just, we have Carter. He's like in his 90s. Uh, I was just a random digression, but I just think that's kind of fascinating. Yeah, Do we have six alive? Yeah. I guess with Trump, it would be six. Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. And we, we like to be like him a lot more. In fact, we plan on holding our company meetings in Hawaii. So. <laughs> <laughs> what? Not Chicago. He spends most of his time out there. Yeah, well, you, our CFO is from Chicago. So. Yes. <laughs> um, do you have a couple examples of people that you look for? You talked about a uh, broad, broad yeah. scope of people that you. The, the, the type of people you like. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe I, I didn't hear the specific type of people, like, a, like Bill Gates, for instance. Um, if I had to pick someone, I would say Nelson Mandela oh, yeah. would be mm -hmm. someone that I have really looked to, someone who truly didn't know the meaning of giving up and fighting for what he believed in till the very end. So... In that sense, I would say that's someone that I look to and I think has a lot of characteristics that maybe, we, how would I say? It, it's more that we can take day to day, not just necessarily as a CEO as, or someone who, who's part of cardio diagnostics, but as a human being. Like, what can we do and what can we um, uh, aspire to be? Um, and yeah, so I would say Nelson Mandela in that sense. Um, yeah. Do you have any book? I, I, I've been wanting to read more on Nelson Mandela. I'm a big biography reader. I agree. I, I think it's, I, I just think it's crazy to think how young he is. Like that was like, comes back to me. Like, can you imagine, like, I mean, yeah, you're like the, a similar age, like being it, gone through everything he's gone through and he still has a whole nother arc of his life that he gets to do crazy stuff. All the time, followed by the secret service. No, thank you, please. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of his his lot a lot of his ability to do stems from his experiences from a very young age, mm -hmm. where he comes from, his family, and things like that. So, uh, I I think you know that really defines who we are, whether we like it or not, to a certain extent as human beings. You know, our experiences as kids, our family, and you know what we've learned, what we've been exposed to at a young age, and I think that really drove Obama to who he became at, a, at a, again, a young age, uh, being, becoming a president, and having the wisdom. The wisdom he really, every time he speaks, it's just inspiration. You know, like it is, when you're stuck in the swamp, it's always good to have a vision of light to move towards. Mm -hmm. And having a few people that have wandered through the swamp and are up on the hill that you can focus on is a good thing. Mm -hmm. I, I, I've been follow, following uh, Bill Gates quite quite a lot recently. And I think we're nearing the end, so I'll just kind of comment on that. He he's, he keeps uh, he just put like a hundred million dollars into working on Alzheimer's research. Mm -hmm. Like that guy's he's always mm -hmm. looking for something to do. Like uh, with him with him, uh, someone made this comment once that like it's like he beat the game, and I was like. 
finding like side missions or side quests. It's like it's more like a video game reference, but um, in the sense that like he's always looking for new challenges. Mm-hmm. And yet he, I guess like with everything he has going for him, like I, you would have to, or else you just get bored. Yeah. Well, you know, maybe perhaps he's not side challenges. Maybe this is his real challenge. Mm-hmm. You know, the thing is, is that we like to think so when you're you, when you just because you've created one of the world's largest companies means that you're done. No, but it's a good mile marker. It is a good mile marker for achievement. Again, I think Bill Gates comes co- comes from a perspective where he wants to make a difference, and there's always ways in the world that you can make a difference. It just just because you cure polio doesn't mean it's going to go away. They had the huge outbreak, mm. so it, yes, you're getting close to solving a problem. But are you really though? Like, are we really ever going to solve anything perfectly? It doesn't, it doesn't sound like he's heading for the retirement home anytime soon. Yeah. You've got to like it about the guy. He has, he has the ability to make change. I mean, a lot of people, everyone has an ability to make change, whether it's financially, time, volunteering, any anything. So he tends to have a little more cash <laughs> 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 to make incentivize others to make a difference, as well as he himself to make a difference. So. In that sense, I think, um, you know, we're lucky to have a person like Bill Gates. Yeah, and both of them, very, very powerful world visions. Thank you for joining us today with Learning with Lowell. I am your host, Lowell Thompson. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We can be found on Twitter at Lowell was here, Facebook, and on the website, learningwithlowell.com. Also sign up for the newsletter where you can hear amazing content every Monday new episodes every Tuesday, and new blog posts around every Thursday. Remember to share and tell your friends. Please and thank you.